Hi everyone, as promised, uh, I am going to be making a video, well, I'm making this video now, on the topic of what I call uh, Jungian existentialism. So, um, I want to make this video because it will help you navigate the upcoming book on the INFJ that I have authored. It will be coming out either this week or next week. At this point, maybe probably more like next week. So fingers crossed. Um, now, I am hopeful that some of you will purchase the book. It is not a very long book. It's only about 135 pages, but it's quite dense. So I really wrote it in such a way that it will be easy to understand if you make the appropriate effort. Um, and it's also relatively easy to digest because it's only an introduction and six chapters for the most part. So it's exciting stuff and I'm really excited to know what you guys are going to think of it. But it does make a reference to what I call Jungian existentialism. And it's in a sense, in addition to being a book about the INFJ, I think it qualifies as a kind of manifesto for Jungian existentialism as a kind of new research approach or movement. Um, so it's kind of the first book in that category now, whether I'll only ever be the one doing Jungian existentialism, whether this will spread across the community, people who are into this approach will see. But a good starting point is to kind of give you a clue as to what exactly it is. So as the name indicates, it's um, an approach that blends together the elements of analytical psychology, so the, the approach of Carl Jung, which birthed, among other things, such models as, as Myers-Briggs and all the current models that, that people operate with these days, including you know models that are popular on YouTube, like C.S. Joseph, Objective Psychology, Rational Typology, uh, and a few other ones. So you have that on the one hand, models that offer to refine our understanding of the types. Um, and then on the other hand, you have existentialism. Existentialism is not psychology. And this is where the book is an original contribution to the field of Jungian studies, you could call it that, because it really is the kind of middle ground, which I think is a fertile ground between the insights of Jung and his followers in the domain of analytical psychology and the insights of existential philosophy. And the method of existential philosophy is typically called phenomenology. So I'm now going to give you some concepts of existentialism and existential phenomenology, because I'm going to assume that you're familiar essentially with core concepts of analytical psychology insofar as it applies to typology, because you know, you're here on this channel probably because you are into the theory of types and its various ramifications through the ages or at least through the 20th and the 21st century so far. What can existentialism add to uh, typology as we know it? Existentialism is known for a famous quote by Jean-Paul Sartre, maybe the most famous of the existentialists with Martin Heidegger. Although you have also Simone de Beauvoir and her great influence over second wave feminism and the following waves, and also Nietzsche and Kierkegaard qualify as existentialists. But Sartre said existence precedes essence. So what you are is essentially defined by what you do, what you choose to do in life. You're not born as, a, as, a, as condemned to be a particular kind of person. You define the person that you want to be. Your essence is defined by your existence and your existence is and unfold across time is based on the choices you make and the projects you lead throughout your life. Okay. Now, why is this important? It's important because Martin Heidegger, who I think is a deeper thinker than Sartre, puts it in this way. He says, one thing that we're missing in our descriptions of reality, whether scientific descriptions or philosophical descriptions or sociological descriptions, or in fact, in our case, what interests us most is typological descriptions. One thing that is missing is getting to the most intimate experiential description of what existing as a certain kind of person feels like, what it feels like. 
We're good at describing, at giving a description that is external to the actual experience. So for example, I'll use an example coming from, from typology. So let's say uh, an INFP, for example. So a person who identifies an INF, INFP arrives at the conclusion that they are INFP by reading descriptions of various types. Now, assuming that they take a genuine interest, they will actually read descriptions of the functions. So they will look at introverted feeling, they will look at NE, they will look at SI, they will look at famous examples of INFP that they might relate to, and so on and so forth. And they will eventually arrive at the conclusion that they are most likely INFP and they might come to care by this identity. But throughout this process, really what's happening is, is, is rational. And even what's emotional about the desire for this connection with a particular type is always in the end rationalized. It's rationalized by essentially saying, I relate to this description. And all of you guys probably have at one point or another had this kind of thing, thought, I certainly have, you know, oh, I relate to how the Hannah is described. I relate to FE auxiliary. I relate to having tertiary TI and its childlike aspect and inferior SE and all the awkwardness and out-of-body experience. So yeah, I relate to these things. But when you say this, you're essentially agreeing rationally to a description that you think fits you, but actually it doesn't really fit you. What it fits is the, is the concept you have of yourself. I'm not saying about a projection, a fantasy of what you might be, and that is actually false. The concept of what that you have of yourself might be very accurate. You know, some people have a very accurate conception of the type that they are. But the type that they are is kind of an individualized instantiation, an example of this floating overarching INFP type or INFJ type. It doesn't actually refer all the way back to their intimate experience of what it means and how it feels to have a particular INFP kind of consciousness, to be open to the world of experience through the lens, through the eyes of an INFP or through the eyes of an INFJ. In the case of my book, the focus of my existential investigation is, is into the INFJ kind of consciousness. What does it feel like to exist as an INFJ? What does it feel like to project myself into the future, relate to others in a social sphere? When I think about death, how, what tends to appear? Uh, when I think about my career, when I think about my relationships, sure, I can, I can read descriptions of the functions and, th and, and think to myself, oh, you know, I might approach a relationship via an FE lens and seek harmony, but that doesn't really tell me anything about myself. I never really experience myself as seeking harmony. I never really experience myself as being insightful. Your experience of yourself prior to reflection, prior to representation is much more intimate. There's something that in a sense is a metaphysical experience. The very quality of the consciousness that opens you up to the world and to other people is the interest of existential, existentialism and existential phenomenology. And that's what I want to get to. And the argument I make in the book is that there's a correlation between this, this quality of consciousness and your type. In other words, that there's, there's not just an INFJ type that has a particular kind of function stack, but that this particular function stack is the expression in rational language of a particular quality of consciousness at a more intimate experiential level. So there is a kind of INFJ existence that all INFJs have in common. That's the argument of the book. And that would apply for other types. Other books could be written using the same method for all the other types. And I do hope that this happens, but we'll have to see. And what's interesting about this approach is that because it focuses on the kind of experience and the kind of existence that an INFJ leads, it points different possible life choices that are going to present themselves as either obstacles to surmount or opportunities to seize for any INFJ. And based on these possibilities, different life paths, an authentic life or an inauthentic life could be led. Inauthentic exi INFJ existence can still very much be a respectable existence despite the name, but maybe not authentic to the full spectrum of possibilities of the INFJ personality. So how do you reach this existential actualization as an INFJ? This is what the book explores and the various ramifications that are associated with it. So if you're interested in the idea and if you're interested in the idea of going very deep with me, I recommend you have a look at the book. See you soon, guys.